I appreciate you all taking the time out of your busy lives to be here tonight. I hope that uh, you find something worthwhile to take with you when we get done. So, tonight, we're going to start, finally, uh, with these some of these topics that are uh, ethical and topics, and in particular, for us, Christian ethics. And uh, again, well, I want to remind you that not everybody will have your opinion, and that's okay, because you all got to have mine. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. You don't really, mine doesn't count either. <laughs> but we all have our views and, and the things that are precious to us. So let's remember to kind of respect one another for that and agree to disagree if they don't happen to align with your particular beliefs. So we are ready tonight for the Christian ethics. We got the guy kind of searching out. And the first one tonight, there it is, is capital punishment. We're going to deal with that this evening. Uh, right or wrong, and uh, we've got both sides, and it's very, very much in the news. Uh, Oklahoma has an execution scheduled for 10 o'clock in the morning for uh, Benjamin Cole, I believe it's, I think it's Cole or Coleman. I wrote it down, and it's the Cole, that's what, Benjamin Cole, he's scheduled to be executed at 10 o'clock in the morning. They have appealed again for last minute uh, reprieve and it all remains to be seen whether that happens or not so what we're looking at tonight is very current very much in our our backyard so to speak um, in fact oklahoma has four scheduled executions for the rest of this year and there's 10 already scheduled for next year so that's 14 uh, people for capital punishment. So it's something we probably need to look at and think about. So this evening, we'll look at the first one, the capital punishment, and we'll find that there are, the definition of course is the legally authorized killing of someone as punishment for a crime. That's pretty out and cold and not much you can argue with about what it is. And men, I mentioned it has four executions for 22 and has 10 for 23. And if you got a sheet, the, you'll notice on one side uh, there are places for you to fill in, and on the back side is one that was so many I didn't want to go with all the scriptures, so I wrote it down. And if you flip it over, it's got scriptures for each one of those uh, particular crimes. So there are three views on capital punishment. The first view we're looking at is reconstruction. And this is the belief that death is required for all serious crimes. Okay, no ifs, ands, or buts, no black, no white. If it's a serious crime, uh, and we've listed some of those in the back uh, on that sheet, that death is required, it's a serious thing. The second thing we'll look at is rehabilitation. And that's no death for any crime. In other words, we put them in jail, keep them up, try to rehabilitate them, and nurse them back into society. The third one is retribution, the death for some crimes, some capital crimes, but not all. In other words, we kind of, well, we can maybe pick and choose depending on, on how you look at it and who's in charge, so to speak. All three of these views are held by both Christians and non-Christians. Some of them appeal to the Bible for justification as proof and proof. Uh, if you remember, if you can go back far enough in your history lessons to remember, slavery was that way. There was people on both sides and had scriptures to back up what they thought was right. It was a moral, ethical issue, but you still had people fighting over what was right and what was wrong. And the same thing in, in capital punishment or any of the other uh, ethical things we look at. We're still going to see that. People battling with one another over what's right and what's wrong. Some appeal to the social morals for their conclusions. They may not say, well, we're not going to the Bible because we don't know enough, but we do know what society expects. And society sometimes expects an eye for an eye. Sometimes it says, no, let, let them have mercy. So in that respect, we're going to do that. And by the way, this, this is not going to be totally a lecture. Uh, 
this this time. If you have something you want to ask or add, just just kind of raise your hand and I'll stop. Okay. Let's see where are we at now. There we go. Two views of the three share the belief in capital punishment for capital crimes of offenses. One view disallows capital punishment under any circumstances. So it will be up to you to kind of decide, you know, where your ethics come from. The reconstructionism, this is the first one I said we would look at. Capital punishment for all serious crimes. Reconstructionism is the opposite end of the spectrum from rehabilitation. Okay, rehabilitation, we're going to bring them back, we're going to make them normal, everything will be fine, all their, all their crimes will be forgiven, and this is the other way around. This is the one that says, no way, they're not going to get out of it. They believe that capital punishment should be extracted for every major crime. So not just, uh, you know, maybe there's certain mitigating circumstances, that's not going to happen. It's for every crime. Sometimes they're called theonomists. If you ever hear that, you'll know that they're the reconstructionism uh, philosophy. They believe that society should be reconstructed on the basis of the Old Testament Mosaic law, except for the ceremonial aspect of it. In other words, whatever it said in the Old Testament for the laws for the Hebrews, that's the laws that ought to be on our books today. And a lot of them are based that way, and some of them are not. Reconstruction, this is what's on the back of your answer sheet if you were looking at it. 21 offenses that call for capital punishment in the Old Testament. And I've got scriptures to, to, that go along with that. I didn't want to read all of them as we go. It would probably be enough just to read the, the offenses. Murder, of course. That's in the Ten Commandments. Construct our contemptuous act against the judge. Causing a miscarriage. False testimony in a potential capital crime. Negligent of a killer's ox owner. And I'd forgot about that one, but if you had an ox that got loose and killed somebody, you were, you were punished by, by death. So you better keep your ox on a chain. <laughs> so, like, do they walk oxes like they do dogs with a chain? Idolatry, blasphemy, witchcraft, or sorcery. Remember, Saul was guilty of that. False prophecy, apostasy. The breaking of the Sabbath, homosexuality, bestiality, adultery, rape, incest, the cursing of parents, rebellion by children, kidnapping, and the last two were the religious aspect, drunkenness by a priest, or unanointed individuals touching the holy furnishings of the temple or the tabernacle. That's the ones that are mentioned in the Old Testament, and that's the ones that they seem to think that we should be basing our, uh, our beliefs on for Reconstructionism. Let's move on to, yes? Didn't they have some cities in the Old Testament where people <coughs> that were condemned to die could go live? Say that again, I almost caught all of it. Didn't they have some cities in the Old Testament where people that were condemned to die could go live? Yes. So that even though God spells out what is a capital punishment, there was also some reprieve for them, I guess? Right. There, there was. There were sanctuary cities is what they were called. Uh, they were allowed to go there and also at the altar, if they got to the brazen altar and could grab a hold of one of the horns, they couldn't be be killed at that point. They had to stand a trial first to, before they could put, uh, dish out any punishment at that point. So those two things were there, but it's, it's kind of hard now. We don't have any altars and horns to grab on. We have sanctuary cities, but they're not for crime. They're for other things now. So, But yes, they did. That's a good point. Things that you read off were in the Old Testament, and some of these things they tried to put or accused Jesus and wanted to put him to death 
according to what they knew. But yet, even at that, uh, they, they succeeded in putting him to death. Of course, God let that happen for our sake. But yet, even with all of that, he asked God to forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, it, it was a righteous thing that, to give us a chance to be with God. So I tell you, this capital punishment thing is very polarizing, kind of like abortion, which it kind of falls under that category somewhat. But I, I struggle to come up with a clear-cut answer. Always have. I guess I always will. And, and, and I appreciate the fact I never really thought about having a class on Christian ethics and talking about capital punishment. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's, to me, these are, and we won't get in, probably won't get into everything that, that we could talk about in the ethics class. We're just kind of going along as we got time. But I, uh, I agree that there are so many things that, that as Christians we kind of don't even think about. We just automatically form our opinions and we go on. And we realize that some of this is the way we were raised. Some of it was the people that we've been involved with for years. Some of it is just, uh, you know, we sit there and say, well, that's just common sense. Well, yeah, but I found out, you know, even in my own family, uh, common sense is not always contagious. It doesn't go through there. So <laughs> Carrie's probably nodding her head and saying, yeah, I know, Dad. I mean, you don't do this all the time. So, but well, let me go on ahead here. Cap uh, rehabilitation now, we're moving into that. Uh, there's no, see, I think I got behind on my notes here, yeah. Um, the first, the, what I wanted to mention was that before we go into this, on your list, the first five, I've tried to divide it off, uh, involve capital offenses. And the second group, six through 11, are for religious offenses. And uh, the 12 through 19 group, homosexuality, kidnapping, all that, goes into moral issues and 20 to 21 are ceremonial duties for priests. The law principles are the same, but the punishment is different. It's kind of like traffic violations. You get, depending on, uh, on your situation, sometimes the, the police officer will let you go, or he will fine you, or you will go to jail. So there's, you know, it's all could be for speeding, but he could choose any one of those three. So now we'll go on to rehabilitation with no capital punishment for any crime. And this is the ones where you see a lot, uh, uh, a lot of folks that follow this are, are in front of the state prison where they execute, you know, and marching with their signs and all. And then no capital punishment whatsoever. And this Norman L. Giesler, where I got a lot of, a lot of help and material from, uh, put it this way, that the essence of this view is that the purpose of justice is rehabilitation and not retribution. We should try to reform the criminal, not punish him, or at least not with capital punishment. So he would basically say, you know, if you're gonna to have to punish him, lock him up and, and keep him there for the rest of their lives. So rehabilitationists will use both, usually the Bible and moral arguments for their view. And I've got a few of those here, and, and it's kind of interesting because they, they kind of hit what I thought was uh, uh, some of the things that I've heard and some of the answers that I've heard, and then maybe you will too, and maybe it'll cause you to think a little bit or ask them questions or whatever, they'll be okay. Rehabilitationists use that, I said that already. There are five biblical responsive examples, and they're opposing biblical replies that we're gonna look at. This is the first one. This is the, the first application. It's kinda like, okay, you know, you got the yin and yang here we're gonna do. Justice is to reform not punish. Okay, let that soak in for a second. Ezekiel 18.23 Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked would die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? God wants to cure the sinner, not kill him. Okay? Let's look at the reply. The opposite side. The purpose of justice is not rehab. 1 Peter 3.18 
For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. This is what Preston was kind of leaning toward a while ago. The Lord looked down and says, you know, forgive him for it. But we don't have that capability all the time. The wages of sin is death, Romans 8. I missed that, but we'll go on here. Capital punishment was abolished with the Mosaic law. Was it? Well, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other cheek to him also. You forming your opinion yet? Let me back up here for a second. Total punishment, or capital punishment, is not for retaliation. That's what they also say. Somebody say, yeah. So whenever Jesus talked about giving to Caesar what is due to Caesar, basically from that, of course, you can read the Bible, and it tells us to obey the law of the land. Okay, so if the law of the land depend on which land you're in, has a different death penalty. There might be some that don't have a death penalty and others that do, but wherever you live, you're subject to wherever you're at. And we are supposed to be good Christians, good workers, good stewards. And, and so whenever you start talking about this uh, capital punishment, there's so many different things that can affect what you're looking at. For example, uh, the people that went and called them by, and those young men that killed all of those people, they were young. And there's a part of your brain that develops at about 18, 19, 20, 21 years old where all of your adult decision making takes place. So those young people don't, they, they can comprehend like adults but they don't necessarily think like adults because that's not part of their physical makeup. It hasn't developed yet. So when they go to prison or killing, and then they get 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, they start realizing what they've done. So there's so many different facets of this capital punishment that you don't really know what to do. I mean, there's just so much to it. Well, we have so many things. You know, the, the scriptures tell us, uh, Paul tells us that the rulers were, were there to keep uh, chaos from happening. And if you look when uh, Jesus was on trial and, and Caesar said to him, said, don't you know I could kill you? And he said, well, you wouldn't have that right if God hadn't given it to you. So we're looking at that. And that's why things are different in different countries and different social uh, uh Factors in those different countries, we don't have the same laws, for instance, that Mexico does. You can go, you can go down there and get accused of, you know, have a car wreck and sit in jail for six months waiting for a trial to find out who was guilty. You know, so there's a lot of things that go on that in other countries, but and what we're trying to deal with is just what the one that we live under right now. And even at that, we're still going to have questions as to, uh, as to, well, you know, as. And that's why when we were going through yes, our last week with the graded uh, uh, absolutionism that we was talking about, that's kind of where we're at. We're kind of looking at, say, well, sometimes we have to look at the lesser of two evils. Which one do we do? You know, and make that judgment. Maybe not. Maybe it's an absolutism. No, that's just definitely not, not acceptable, and, and that's it. So we use all three of those to try to form our own ethics. And what, I wanted, what we're trying to do here is trying to make everyone realize that uh, your, your, I don't want to call it prejudice, but I guess it is in a way, your ethics are what you believe to be right. Okay, now that may not agree with your name. You know, you may, you may say, okay, it's okay to watch R-rated movies, but this person over here says, no, man, you can't go past PG. You know, well, that's an, an, an ethical thing for them and for you. So all these things are kind of, kind of to wake us up to the fact that we are prejudiced people and that we need to be able to get along and we need to uh, 
uh, do the best we can at, at trying to make the moral judgments that God wants us to. Yes, sir. Well, I struggle with ethics and belief. And I'm sitting here thinking, ethics is what I believe, but that's not true. Ethics is what we use, what kind of logic we use to make decisions, whereas our belief is what we believe. Would that be correct? Uh, I think our beliefs are our ethics are formed through our beliefs. The, uh, what we think is right and wrong is right and wrong. The, the Bible says that if you think it's sin, it's sin. Okay, what would be sin to me might not be sin to you. You see what I'm saying? If you were eating meat that was offered to an idol, you know, some people got really offended about it. It was against their ethics, their beliefs. They're almost interchangeable. Johnny? I do think it has to do with moral judgment. Ethics are, are, as a group, as a society, as a culture, there's a standard of acceptable behavior and unacceptable behavior. Uh, evil, good, bad, whatever you want to call it. But there's some standards up there of what's acceptable and what and what you know what what things are horrendous, you know. Uh, we're we're not if if someone is executed, their their spirit is not killed no, that's not. by the state. Okay, they can still turn to God. Some of these folks have, I think, a lot of. We don't know them all. I don't know if there are any numbers on it, but, but uh, we hear of people that have changed their lives uh, after being punished uh, because I think the issue is whether to punish them appropriately or not. I think a, a lot of the standards in the Bible have to do with the severity of the crime. We, we, uh, uh, a popular saying uh, in, in my studies was uh, punishment should fit the crime. So that the more serious the crime, the more serious the punishment. So if you're going to lock somebody up for 20 years or 30 years for some crimes, and then they, in a horrible way, kill or mutilate somebody, they get the same punishment. But in, in a lot of people say, well, no, that doesn't fit the, the that's not, the horrendous stuff is not the word they use. What, the, what word do they use a lot of times? Murder is so evil and ugly as if they're not all they, There are, um, I believe in this country especially, requirements that we have because because of the way that the country was established. Heinous, heinous crimes, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, as far as standards, we have standards that we set in, in this congregation, or not in this congregation, it's, well, in this congregation too, but in... Uh, in the USA, we have certain standards that we have ad adopted since we put out the Constitution, okay? And at one time, it was okay for f slavery, but it's not, you know, not ethical now. You know, to even, it's almost not ethical to even talk about it anymore. You can't go through it in schools. It's almost that bad. But... Right. Some people, there were some people that did, sure. Um, Thomas Jefferson, I know he had slaves, and yet he uh, really wanted to let them go, but he didn't know how to do it economically because that was the way they, they survived. So all those things that we're talking about are, are, are standards, if you want to call it that, their beliefs, their, um, their ethics. Um, we talk about mores, you know, for this, this is the way it's always been done. Well, you know, that, there's some truth to that. You go over to India and you'll find a whole different uh, philosophy and ethics. I remember my dad in World War II got stationed over there in Calcutta. And they went to town in a jeep. And, of course, when they went to town, they had Brahma bulls going through the stores and wrecking things and nobody would run them out because that was one of their gods and they were in this jeep and they said so the guys you know how soldiers do and they're all saying hey said you know if you'll hit one of those cows we'll give you five dollars or 50 bucks and he said 
no, Sahib, you know, which was friend, I think, said, no, Sahib, uh, but I'll run over a man for five. And that always struck me as being, you know, uh, for him, that was ethical. Couldn't hit that cow, but you could run over that man. It wouldn't make any difference. So again, we go back to where you're at and what you're doing and what standards have been set. We try to go make our standards as Christians. We try to look to the book as much as we possibly can. And there's still areas of gray that allow us to, to make our own decisions. But when we make our own decisions, we have to keep in mind that someday we're going to stand before God and we're going to have to make our case because he's going to say, okay, Bob, why did you think that slavery was right or slavery was wrong? He's going to want to know. I mean, he already knows, don't get me wrong, but we're going to have to answer for it face to face with our maker. And that's why I think that these, these ethics things should be at least reviewed in our minds and, uh, and be flexible to the degree that maybe we've been, might need to change our opinion after all these years, or maybe not. You know, maybe we'll stay right where we're at and it's okay. So capital punishment was prior to the law of Moses. This was the reply that we just mentioned for that case. Romans 13, three and four, for he, the government, this is part of what we're talking about with uh, uh, a few minutes ago, for he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he doesn't bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an, an, uh, an avenger, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So we see that God is still allowing uh, the government to take charge in certain situations. He put them there. Caesar, you know, you wouldn't have this power if God hadn't granted it to you. United States Congress or United States Senate wouldn't have had anything to do if God hadn't granted the power for him to try. It's not limited to or abolished under the old or new law. So these things that capital punishment is not according to this either way. Having fun yet? <laughs> so neither Cain nor David or the adulterous woman were given capital punishment. This is the rehabilitation side. And both Cain and David committed murder, but they weren't condemned for their crime. And the adulterous woman, we know what that crime was. That was automatically take out and stone you. She was under the penalty of death for her sin, but none of them served that death penalty. The reply, these were special cases. Both Cain and David avoided death and served punishment from God for the rest of their life. Cain was, was almost an exile to, to the whole rest of the family. All of his lineage came down. David, suffered because of his crime, lost his first, the firstborn between him and Bathsheba. And then he had to live with the fact that he had put that man to death. Did David, did David, uh, repent? Did David repent? Yes, he did. But did he not serve the consequences? You know, and he did that too. Yes, he repented, but the result of what he did still uh, caused a lot of anxiety in David's life all the way through. His own, his own children turned against him. Absalom tried to take over his throne and uh, uh, was adulterous with his, some of his wives, you know, right in front of him. And it, so, you know, you got, he paid for it in a lot of ways that uh, we don't think about so much, but he was punished. Cain committed the first murder and the rules that evidently not be established. This is one of their arguments. Maybe that's true. Maybe God hadn't told them, don't kill anybody yet. We don't know. That's under, under that not enough information category that we use a lot. David needed two witnesses under the law. And who would testify against the king? Yeah, that's a good point there. I, I, if I'd have been in David's time, I wouldn't want to stand and accuse him. Because uh, you accuse the king and you're wrong. And nobody backs you up. You're, you're done. That's it. The adulterous woman received a pardon from the law, and she was also told to go and sin no more. 
John 8, 3 through 11 in that story. We don't know whether she did or didn't. We do know what, what we know and that she was forgiven at that point. And there was no death penalty given. Yes, sir. Chapter 8, where that's found, 1 through 10, okay. and all verse 1. What's your question? 3 through 11, I think, is it 8 through 10? John 8, uh, three, 3 through 11, whatever. Okay. Uh, I think a lot of times we misunderstand this passage, but we always focus on the woman and Jesus giving her mercy. But what happened there is you had the men who brought her, brought her in unrighteousness. Jesus wouldn't put her to death because they brought her in unrighteousness because in the law, in, uh, I believe it's Deuteronomy 22, 22, it says that both the man and the woman are to be put to death. And the men only brought the woman. So they were unrighteous. They were sinning. You know, when he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. They were sinning when they brought her there. So, did Jesus, was she guilty of a sin that was punishable by death? Absolutely. But just like our laws, we can't, you can't cheat as a prosecutor to get information and do things like that. And just according to the law, they couldn't have brought her alone. They had to have brought the man. And yeah. without that, it was unrighteousness. So Jesus says, let he who is without sin be the first to cast the stone. And it was over at that point. Good point. Yes. And that's very true. They, uh, uh, I, I can't add much to that. It's right there. You know, so. It wasn't necessarily Jesus saying, what you're doing is okay and not punishable. It's, well, yeah. But he, as, he as a result, according to the law of Moses, Jesus as a result of his action, well, he could not possibly go through with, with putting her to death uh, for the reason that you mentioned. You know, the guy wasn't there. They may not have known who it was, but she was caught evidently in the act. So they knew who it was, you know, as far as the guy. But you're right, they didn't bring him. Is that Paul back there? Yeah, I, I think there's one other variable in that, in, in this story, and that is she was now in the presence of God, being right there with Jesus. And I think that that can change things, just like, take the thief on the cross, for instance. We don't know his background. We don't know if he was at some point a believer, if he was that type. All we know is that he's there, he's hanging on a cross, and he is finally compelled, and he sees the Lord, and the Lord tells him that he's basically forgiven. He gives him his forgiveness, but he's in the presence of the Lord, just like he healed the guy in the mat. It's not, I don't think it's the same situation for people that are not in the presence of God, which can't be anymore, Christ is in heaven. Yeah. It's not always the same thing, because he has the power to forgive you right then and there on the spot. You don't have to go get baptized, you don't have to go do anything else. He has the power to do it, just like he has the power to tell the paralytic to stand up, take his mat, and walk. So, well, he even said that. Is it, uh, um, is it a bigger sin for me to forgive a sin or to raise somebody from the dead? Which one would you rather prefer? You know, it, it was kind of tongue in cheek type thing, but saying, you know, I, I have the ability to do this. If I didn't have the ability, I wouldn't do it, couldn't do it. But he had that ability because he was given it. God had granted it to him and he was allowed to use it. He was, you know, he was God on earth. And if you made a decision, it was good enough. But, uh, but it's a good point all the way around. Thank you, guys. Let me move along here, see, um, see our next point here. New Testament love rules out capital punishment. This is where they go to the scripture again to say, but I say unto you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. I always have a problem when somebody pulls out one verse and uses it for defense. And not just these guys, but any, in any case. Because we can do what we want with scriptures if we want to pick and choose. Got, that's something we need to keep in mind too with our ethics as we go. I mean, you could justify uh, 
committing adultery with your neighbor because Jesus said, love your neighbor. And if you want to just take it as literal, but it's not. We know that if we look at what he was talking about, it's not even close. But if we want to just pull that little section out and use it, then somebody could make an argument with it. Somebody's stupid, but they could make an argument with it. So, but I say unto you, to love your enemies, no greater love hath a man than, come on, you guys know, John 15, 13. What greater love hath a man than to give his life for his brother? Another reply, love and capital punishment are not contrary to one another. John 3.16, 1 Peter 3.18. We know John 3.16, so I didn't print that in there, but we've got, for the Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So that's the counter for the other one. You got, like I said, you got both sides. You can take which side you think is is morally correct for you, and ethical. The very principle of the two are foundations in the story of the cross: a life for a life. Jesus gave us life. Uh, hang on just a second. Jesus gave his life in order to save ours. So we got one life for all. That's again in Romans. Yes, back there. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, this is an issue that's very personal to me. I've, I've visited a lot of relatives in a lot of prisons. And personally, and I, and I know there's a lot of different opinions, but personally, I see it not as an issue of ethics, but an issue of logic. That when you kill somebody, for any reason, which there are justifiable reasons to kill somebody in combat or self-defense or any other thing, but when you kill that person, you take away any opportunity that person would ever have to come to Christ. I disagree with that. Who's got the disagree? I'm sorry. Uh, he took away his own. You did not take away. If somebody kills them, they deserve to die. If, if I'm to love my neighbor, that's easy enough. But if a stranger comes and kills my neighbor's kid, I can't love him because there's not enough room in the world for me to love that guy who killed my neighbor who I love. But so don't we all argue, deserve death? But that's not a that's not scripturally accurate. Scripture doesn't say, well, if your neighbor or if your enemy doesn't do something heinous, then you can go ahead and, and love them. We're we're called to love our enemy, not based on whether they're good or not, right? So I would have a hard time with that. You know, I, I'm not saying I would be able to either. I. I I would probably be signed on his own death warrant when he killed my neighbor. Be easy to do. And he might have to face the state for that. But we're still called to love. You know. I don't know, it'd be fun. I think I may be making up a word, un, uh, re, uh, rehabilitatable. 
Is that not good? We're the zombies. Yeah. So there are some that they're, they're never going to uh, be, re be able to be rebuilt. The, the antisocial brains that they have, the uh, sociopathic brains that they have, they can't be rebuilt. So that doesn't answer the question whether they should be put to death or not, but that's just saying that there are some that cannot be rebuilt. Well, it's Benjamin Cole. That's one of the things that they're using for him is that he's not capable. He doesn't understand why they're going to want to kill him, and that's that's what he knows. And whether that's justifiable or whether you know, we don't know whether people are faking it sometimes or whatever. But we have to you know have to look at it, and a decision has to be made somewhere by someone. Look at the rap sheet is what it is. The rap sheet of the individual. Whether he should live or die should be in his rap sheet. If he is incorrigible, yeah. he's useless to society. Carrie, you had something? Did you want to say something now? Oh, chicken. Okay. <laughs> All right, we got. Uh, we're just about out of time, so this is probably a good spot to stop, and we'll finish the capital punishment next week. Uh, hopefully, but I appreciated the discussion and the ideas and the comments, and that's what I wanted to do in this part of it for sure. When we start getting into the to the actual um, ethical issues, I guess I should say. So, God bless you. Have a good week, and Lord willing, we'll see you back here Sunday. Do what? Oh yeah, yeah. They, they did. Uh,